Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Here we are in, uh, at the bridge. Welcome, Facebook folks. We're glad to have you joining us. And, uh, you know, literally people from all over the country are, uh, are tuning in. It's so exciting to see that happen as they, um, as they check and see what we've got. But uh, the bridge welcomes you. And we're going to have some lovely things to, uh, to praise God for. Um, so if you would uh, join us as we begin to do some uh, praise and worship for him. And his power, his power is what we can depend on. Yeah. 
does live, doesn't he? Amen? Yes, yes. All right. We're going to have a um, part. So this left side will be the first, uh, first section, and then the right side will be the echo of uh, You're Worthy of My Praise. And then we sing the chorus all together, okay? So this side starts. next song that talks about what we believe and it just fits right in with what's going on with the world today we believe
We do have a couple of praises this morning before we, we begin praying. Um, just heard from, uh, from Sue Knight, her granddaughter Mackenzie. She is doing much better, so they're pretty sure she has uh, the Rocky Mountain fever from a tick bite, but the antibiotics did their job, and um, she is doing so much better. So thank you for praying for Mackenzie. It's still going to take some time for that uh, test to come back, but they would just like to know and confirm what she did have. So. Thank God that uh, McKinsey is doing much better. We also have an update on Paul. He's doing uh, much better right now. So they did have to remove his foot from his shin on down. And uh, towards the middle of the week, he'll start rehab. So prayer is much appreciated. And um, uh, he uh, cards and things to, to lift him up. And, and the goal to, for them to get away for family vacation is in, in July. So... Um, praise God that he is doing much better, and we'll continue to help and do whatever we can for Linda and the family. So those are two updates for you. Uh, we do have our prayer list, and um, God is doing some amazing things, isn't he? So I know we probably don't have time to go into all the things that he is doing, but he is working mightily, mightily. Um, Galatians 5.13 struck me today. It says, my friends, you were chosen to be free, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do anything you want. Use it as an opportunity to serve each other with love. And you know what? We can do hands-on loving people. We can pray for them. And I am so thankful that God hears our prayers. And um, he is faithful. And we have his word to depend on. We have each other to depend on, right? Right. Okay. So if you would, um, if you would bow your heads with me, we'll, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we lift up your name and we praise you for the miracles that are happening in the lives within our families. Thank you, Father, that Mackenzie is doing so much better. Thank you for saving her life. Thank you for being with Paul. Please help him to heal quickly and be comforted and encouraged and strengthened. Help us to reach out and do what we can to help the family. Father, we thank you for listening to us as we pray throughout this, the week, and every day you hear us praying. And even now, as we begin to, as we begin to uh, prepare our hearts for, uh, for Mike's message that he's going to bring this morning. Help us to be open to your truth. Help us to hear your word. And help us to make it come alive in our lives. Father, we thank you that you've brought us together today. And we thank you for the churches and in the, in the communities that that we have here in our in our towns here, uh, Galena and, and Mount Gilead. We lift up those churches and pray that they are hearing your word and that they're inspired and that they're loving you and praising you. Father, we ask that you be with uh, Pastor Al to, uh, to today as he has just gotten married yesterday. Um, bless them, bless their lives, and we look forward to meeting his new bride when, they, when, when he is back. Thank you, Father, for the chances that we've had to, uh, to love each other this week and to do things for one another. Thank you for the joy of our babies that are here, that we can, as grandparents, uh, that we can love them and, and nurture and just be a part of their lives. Thank you, Father, for the beautiful time of spring. We've been reminded of resurrection and that we were able to celebrate last week that your son rose from the dead. And we have eternity to look forward with him. Thank you for the love that's going to govern our lives and how your word is so real. 
Thank you, Father, as we calm the world around us and we settle down to to truly hear what you have uh, gifted to us today through Mike and his message. We thank you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I want to say welcome. Welcome to everyone who's out watching this on our internet. And I want to say thank you for coming. And I appreciate you all being here. I, I got out of the lay pastor program and graduated in 04, which is what, 17 years ago. And out of all the times God has blessed me with the opportunity to bring his word to his people, I don't think I have ever preached for a pastor who was getting married. And I, I kind of had to think about that because that's a change. And ever since, ever since I found out I was going to have this opportunity, change. Change has been on my mind. And I thought, good change, bad change. I, I always have laughed. How many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? How many Christians does it take to change a light bulb? Change. What do you mean change? We don't change anything. And I've always laughed about that. I'm like, what is it about change that we don't like? We don't like change. And why is that? Pastor Al's life's about to change, and that's not a bad thing. And it's not something that he won't like. That's going to be exciting. But yet, when we talk about change, we automatically get this feeling of, I don't like change. I don't want change. And you know, I, I thought, I'm just going to look in the Bible. I'm curious. What is the deal with change? And you know, I, I, you look in Hebrews 13, verse 8. A verse we're common with, we know. It simply says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that. Jesus doesn't change. I looked back in, in Exodus when Moses and God were having this discussion because Moses needed to go talk to the Israelites and he did not want to do that. And God said, I am who I am. This is in Exodus 3, it's in verse 14. God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you. Okay? I can say, I was yesterday. I will be tomorrow. But I am today. God can say, I am yesterday. I am tomorrow. And I am today. And I thought, okay, I buy that. I buy that. That makes sense. Then I connected it. Then I connected it. God shared with me Genesis 1.26. I'm not going to read the whole verse. I, I think the whole verse will be displayed so that you know I'm not taking this out of context. But in Genesis 1, 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Verse, 20, or yeah, verse 27, it says, So he did. He did exactly what he said. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. If I am made in the image of God and God does not change, this answers the question to why I am uncomfortable with change. This by itself proves you are made in the image of God. God never changes. And when cha life changes and things change we don't like it 
because we're made in the image of God. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you love us, you are with us, you guide us, you protect us. We thank you for being a part of our lives. We thank you for reminding us that we are yours and we are made in your image and we belong to you. Father, we ask that you'll be with us now, that the words that you want us to hear, we will hear. What you want us to learn, we will learn. And what you want us to understand, we will understand. And God, I ask that you'll just be with me, that I will stay out of your way. Not my words, your words. These things we are praying in your holy and precious Son, Jesus' name, amen. This whole day, for me, started off with a sermon about change. And I had the opportunity about two weeks ago to be in a place. I'm going to tell you exactly what it was in the best of my ability. I'm going to do it in a professional manner, and I'm going to do it with love. See, I was in a place that made me remember. It made me remember the one thing in my heart that I've known my whole life. I will find exactly what I'm looking for. The question has always been, what am I looking for? See, if I'm looking for negative, I'm going to find negative. If I'm looking for bad, if I'm looking for evil, I'm going to find bad. I'm going to find evil. But if I'm looking for good, if I have decided I'm going to look for the good, I will find it. I will find it. Good, right, positive, it's there. It's here. It's available. We will see it if we look for it. See, south end of Columbus. I don't like refer, referring to it as the way I was told, but I was told this would be a very low income area of the city of Columbus. I was told while I am working in this area to ensure that my truck is locked, my alarm is set, and never leave anything unattended. Don't lay a bag of tools down and come back to get it. Don't leave the equipment there. Always keep everything with me. This is what I was told. We went to an old school building. This building had been abandoned by the city schools and is now being used as a rehabilitation center, which I have no idea what that means. And I, I say that honestly because there are students here, young, fun, students but they go to school there and we go in and we are setting up a system up on the roof clear up on top I my job is to put the antenna array around the building so that this antenna array will send out a signal over a 16 square block area because they are giving to each student a small iPad laptop and it connects to this system because these students cannot afford internet. They cannot afford computers. So the school is giving these to the students and I am setting up the system which allows them access to the internet to be able to do their school work and be able to work with the other students. We spent several days working on this older building. It's a three-story building from the third floor, then, you go into a small doorway that goes up an old rickety stairway to the attic. That's floor four. From there, we go through a hatch up onto the flat roof. I'm five stories up. We can see the area that we're trying to install the system. And approximately day two, approximately day two, down the road, right in front of the building, comes a string of cars 
and they're honking their horns and they're yelling out the windows and we kind of looked over and they're cheering and they're excited and there's people with their heads sticking out of their windows at the sunroof that's open and they're just excited and I'm thinking oh, apparently somebody got married. Well, a guy that I have worked with for over 30 years looks at me and goes, dude, that's not a wedding. So look at the front car. And this group of cars goes down through this alley, goes back up over here, across that alley, back down there and back around. They went around several times when I got a good look at the front car. The front car was a hearse. That's exactly what it was. And that's exactly what it was doing. And it was on its way to the cemetery. And I remember, I remember thinking in my mind, just get me out of here. I don't understand this area. I've never been in this kind of area. I don't want to be here. It was approximately 3.45 when that happened. 4.30, we called a day. So at 4 o'clock, we start gathering up our equipment, come down off the roof, secure the hatches, secure everything in the attic of the building, come down, secure the doors. And this guy that I've worked with and I went over and uh, we went through the security and told him, we're done for the day, we're going to take off. As we approached the security guard, two teachers came in the front door, came up the steps and walked up, and the security guard said, wow, that was a good one that time. I could hear it clear inside. And they were both like, yes, it was outstanding. There were more cars in that string than I think I've ever seen. That was a good one. And I'm just, apparently they saw my expression of, what, yeah, we're done, we're leaving. And, and I, don't, I don't know exactly the conversation that took place but one of the teachers looked at us and said, I'll bet you had a good view from the roof of that. And I said, yeah, I saw it. And she proceeded to explain to me about a little boy This is exactly what happened to me that day, too. A little boy who never knew his dad was abandoned by his mom. Ended up in about six different foster homes, but came to that school, went to church in a big church right across the street, and what he did was he would go around to the kids and help them fix their bicycles. He found out that a mile and a half over on High Street, there was a gas station that would allow him to clean the restrooms, clean the restrooms in a gas station. And they would give him enough money that he could fix a bicycle tire. And he would fix children's bikes. And then he would have the fun of being able to ride the bike back and give it to the child. He never had his own bike. And that advanced to a point where he learned how to help people fix flat tires on their cars. He learned how to work enough to get gas for people to have gas in their cars. He was a member of the church. He taught Sunday school as he grew. He served the same Lord Jesus Christ that I serve right here. Do you see? I was looking totally at the wrong thing. This man served Jesus every day, loved Jesus every day, and I wasn't in an evil place. I was in the midst of God. And I stood there and I thought, that's the way it should be. Because she told me he won. He finally won. God took him home to be with him. And they were celebrating that. They were celebrating that. And I'm thinking, wow, did I ever miss something? And of course, God had to just smack me about as hard as he could to get me to realize, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? And I thought, 
I don't like change. I don't like change. My mom and dad have both passed away within a four-year period, both of my uh, in-laws and my parents, all four passed away. I don't like that change. I don't like when I go to Colorado and I see a big herd of elk, I call mom, mom, check us out. I say, oh, big, can't. I don't like that. But see, when I think of this gentleman and the celebration of his life, I think my mom and dad both knew the Lord Jesus Christ. I guarantee my in-laws both knew the Lord Jesus Christ. I guarantee all four of them have accepted him as their personal savior and they're in heaven. I should be celebrating that, not complaining that my life has changed, but celebrating their lives that changed as they got to go to heaven. Does that make me not hurt inside? No. Do I still miss my mom? Yes. But you know I need to look at the celebration, not the agony. And as I studied a little more onto that, I said, it still hurts. It still hurts. But you know what? I've got to look at the celebration. I've got to look at the positive. In, in the study, I was brought back to a verse that we all learned as kids. Jesus wept. You know, it's in John, it's in the 11th chapter, it's the 35th verse, Jesus wept. If you read the 36th verse, the Jews that were with him when that happened simply said, see how much he loved him? Let me bring you up to where I'm at. Lazarus has died. Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus's. Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Lazarus has passed away. Did Jesus love Lazarus more than he loves me? Did he love Lazarus more than he loves you? And verse 35 says he wept. So I thought, you know what? I understand this. And it makes sense. So I was reading back through there, and all of a sudden, I kind of got my eyes opened. I asked approximately 12 people, why did Jesus weep? And I think out of the 12 people, 10 of them, like me, thought it was because Lazarus had passed away. I want to show you something. I just want to show you something. I'm going to jump right down through this, but I'm not going to pull a single verse out of context. I'm going to back up and look at verse 4. We're in John, we're in 11, chapter 11, that whole chapter is about Jesus talking to his disciples when he receives word in verse 4. When he heard this, that Lazarus was extremely sick, Jesus says, this sickness will not end in death. Note, will not end in death. He did not say Lazarus would not die. He said it won't end in death. And I thought, that's, that's a unique wording. I continued reading on down. I get down to verse 11, 12, 13. And after he had said this, and again, he had been talking to his disciples, after he said that, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. I... I'm going to go there and wake him up. His disciples, being just like you and I, would have thought exactly the same thing. They said, well, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. How do you get over any ailment? You sleep it off. You crawl in bed, pull them blankets up, just leave me alone, let me sleep, and I get better. And that's exactly what they're thinking. Jesus, of course, was not speaking of Lazarus being sick and sleeping. Jesus is speaking of his death. But his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus 
is dead. I want you to think about that for a second. Jesus knows right here, right now, Lazarus is dead. Jesus has already told the disciples how this is going to end. There are no tears. There are no tears. Jesus knows he's dead, but he's not crying. Jesus talks to the disciples, and they decide to go, and they go to where Lazarus is, where the family is. He meets up first with Martha. Lazarus is one of Lazarus' sisters. When he does, he says to her, Jesus says to her, I am in verse 23 now, your brother will rise again. She is thinking in the resurrection. And Jesus continues on in there, I don't have it on the screen, continues on to explain to her that I am the resurrection. Not me, obviously, but Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus continues on, and he gets close to where everybody is together. I'm in John, still in chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 32. When Mary reached the place, this is the other sister, when she reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, how much they were in the agony of the change of losing Lazarus. He was deeply moved in spirit, and he was troubled. Where have you laid him? Where have you laid him? Jesus asked. She replies, come and see, Lord. Come and see. And Jesus wept. Jesus is not weeping because Lazarus has passed away. He is weeping because of the pain that the people are feeling about the loss of Lazarus. That told me right there, if I am willing to come to Jesus, what did it say back here in verse 32? When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, if you were to read that whole, par- you know, that whole chapter, Martha did the same thing. When she got to where Jesus was, I believe it's an exact word for word. When they got to Jesus, Jesus cried with them. If you know Jesus, you will never cry alone. Change hurts. Things, I don't, I'm probably not allowed to say this, but I don't think I can get fired. Things suck. They do. You know, there's going to be a time when you're just going to stop and you're going to cry. You're going to say, I just, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through this. You are not alone. Jesus weeps. Jesus won't weep because my mom and dad have gone to be with him, but he will because he knows it hurts me. He didn't weep because Lazarus was dead. Read on down through there. You know the answer to that. Jesus calls Lazarus out of that grave, and he lives. But he did with the agony that the sisters felt. If you know Jesus, you will never weep alone. Jesus had said from the beginning, this won't end in death, and it didn't. And you know what? My parents' lives didn't end in death either. My wife's parents' lives didn't end in death. It looks like it to me because I'm here, and they are not. But that's not what happened. They're in heaven with the Lord. My boss had led me to believe 
that I was going into a dangerous place. It's no more dangerous than anywhere else. Did I have to be a little bit careful? Sure. It's always a good idea not to leave your tools set around unattended. That's always a good idea. But you know what? I was up working in that attic, understanding about the man who gave his life and served the Lord Jesus Christ every day, thinking, this is a cool place. This is a cool place. And we're up there working, and I've got to get some stuff out of my truck. That simply means down the hatch, down the stairways, out into the hallway, down, 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 out, pick up, and back up. I am now on a mission. I come down the stairway, I come out the classroom, and I walk out into the hallway into a middle of a Nerf dodgeball match. Walked right into the middle of it. And I'm like, ping, ping, you know, big Nerf balls. And these kids are just having a blast. The instant I walked in there, those children stopped. And one of the little boys came up and apologized. Sir, I'm very sorry. I didn't see you coming out there. This place is just absolutely packed with the love of Jesus. And I picked up the ball and I tossed it to him and I said, no problem. I said, if I had time, I'd play with you. And they were all like, that's cool. Come on. We, you know, we're into this. And I'm like, no, no, no. I, I, I need to go. I went over across the hall, and you, there's like a little hallway that cuts off that goes to an elevator because I'm too lazy to go down the stairs. Took the elevator down, went out to my truck, got my tools, came back, came up the elevator. And when the elevator door opened, there lays two big Nerf balls. And I said, uh-huh. So I did exactly what I was told not to do. I set my tools down and I left them, picked up two Nerf balls. And I'm like, walk up very carefully. And I just stepped out and I went, tee, like that, two directions. And I hit two people. And of course, then it was on. Then it was on. Then I didn't get an apology that says, oh, we're sorry for hitting you. Oh, no. There's the guy with the target on his back. And we had fun for, oh, I don't know, 15 seconds. Then I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I have to get back to work. And I got my tools, and I went on upstairs. What was I looking for? I had been led to believe certain things, and I allowed myself to look for the bad. And it was absolutely fun. It was enjoyable. Jesus was there. The kids were excited. We all had fun. What was I looking for? Change is not necessarily bad. It's what you make out of it that makes it hard or good. I want to wrap up. I want to wrap up. You know me, I don't have 30, 40, 50 minute sermons. When I practice this at home, it took me about 45 minutes, which means if it's been 15 minutes, we're lucky. I don't know why that is, but that always happens. But I just, I wanted to finish up here by reminding you that if you are with Jesus, you will never cry alone. And I want to take just a second right here. I know you. I have been in this church for a long time, and I know you. You folks out there on the Internet, I don't know. If you want to know who this man is that will never let you cry alone, in the Bible, there's a book called John. Not 1 John, 2 John, 3rd, just John. Read it. Read that one book all about Jesus. It will explain to you who he is, why he is, how he was treated. And I'm not asking you to do anything. Don't feel like, well, before I start reading the Bible, I have to stop smoking, I have to stop drinking. No. Don't do any of that. Take your Bible. Read just the book of John. You will learn who this man is that loves you so much that he'll never let you cry alone. When I was studying change, I had one verse that I just wanted to take a minute to share with you in closing. That verse came out of Matthew. It was Matthew 18, verse 3. Jesus is speaking, and he simply says, I tell you, 
Truly, I tell you, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is not saying you have to become immature. He is not saying you got to run around like a three-year-old. He is not saying that. Let me explain a picture that I saw. Y'all may have seen it, but I saw it that explains exactly what that verse says. And if I say this politically incorrect, I apologize. That is not my point. There's a little girl with her mom and dad in a grocery store. And as she's in this grocery store, she meets another little girl who is also with her mom and dad. And these two little girls get all excited, give each other a big hug, and they're like, Mom, check this out. Both of them were wearing little pink skirts, the exact same type of sweater, same picture on the front of the sweater. They were dressed identically, and they gave each other a hug, and they go, I have a twin. This is so cool. When you look at the picture, the skin wasn't even close to the same color. They didn't even begin to realize that. They didn't care about that. They immediately were like, we're dressed alike. We're twins. This is so cool. See, I can be mad when people drive and irritate me. Or I can realize they're brothers in Christ. I can get mad when somebody walks by me and doesn't say hi. Or I can realize, you know what? When I'm on a mission, I walk right by people and I don't see them. These are brothers in Christ. How do I look at it? These two little girls understood right off. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what you look like. You're my twin. You're my sister. That is how we need to see each other. That is is how you enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ died for everybody. South end of Columbus, Sunbury, Ohio. He died for everybody so that we could make the decision to love each other unconditionally. Back to where I was a minute ago. You can't do that. You can't do that. Jesus can. You have to make the decision. I want Jesus in my life. Then you can love unconditionally. I'm out of notes. I'm going to go back here. I assume there were people behind me. I'm going to go back and get my guitar. We're going to sing. But I just want you to know, Jesus does not cry because someone went home to be with him. Jesus cries because you cry. Remember that. When life gets to a point that you're like, you know what, this just sucks. I just can't do this. You're right. You can't. He can. And he's there with you. And he cries with you. If you'd like to stand with us and sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Is that God?
It's so quiet sometimes, you know. Then I heard them singing their part. I thought, wait, that's their part? Okay. Anyways, it's just kind of, it's so cool. We have such a great time praising God and practicing for y'all. So, well, if you'd like to go ahead and have a seat, we're at the uh, getting close to the end of our service, and uh, we're going to have a couple of announcements. Um, I know that uh, we are going to be hearing from from Emily, um, if she'd like to come on and, and make her way up for us. Uh, I do want to say before she um, makes it up here that the, there is an elder meeting today at 4 o'clock, so FYI. And Emily, here you go. There you are. You're welcome. All right, so I'm on the search committee, and we are right now are in the midst of... Um, re-updating all of our records and whatnot so that we can make a profile um, and what that entails is that we need to get information from you guys so today on the back table out there I have this sign and it tells you what to do and I'll tell you in just a minute um, and index cards and we just need you to give us some updated information just so that we are clear in Facebook world, just give us a, a email to the church um, or call it. That's how we're going to do it. So the things we need is on the um, index card, we only need one per household. So as long as someone in your family fills it out, that would be great. We just need everyone's name in your household, an email address that you guys want, an uh, address, phone number, and we need birthdays and ages of everybody in your um, home. That will just help us be able to make our profile up so that we can get moving and grooving on starting our search. So if you all can do that, I do have this yellow paper. It will be out there so you can remember exactly what we need. And I already filled out my family's, so you can have that as an example too. And I'll be out there if you need help. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Okay. All right. I don't think we have any other announcements. Like I said, elder meeting today at 4. And soccer practices have begun. So there's lots of kiddos out here. And uh, so prayers would be appreciated um, to not have rain, right? And uh, for the kids just to really enjoy. I love seeing the pictures on Facebook of the little, little ones. I saw, I saw Everly. And her friend, and it's just, it just blesses our hearts. So, um, all right, if you'd uh, want, to, yes. Okay. Okay. So they will dedicate the soccer building next Saturday, the one that was built out for the refreshments and things. So if you'd like to be sure and come on out for that dedication and um, cheering on the soccer program, um, God has blessed us amazingly, right? Right. Um, so if you'd like to stand with us, we'll have our closing prayer, and then we'll get on with our sharing the love. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've heard your truth today. We are encouraged and we are forgiven. We are loved. Help us today to go out and share that love uh, with the folks that, uh, that are in our family, our neighbors. Help us to go back to reading John and understand what you are about and why you are about. And thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Uh, bless us this week as we leave here and we ask and give all the praise and glory to you in Jesus name. Amen. All right, on the count of 3, 1, 2, 3, share the love. <laughs>